So let me summarize what we targeted and did in this entire course quickly uh, for your uh, help in understanding various aspects of neutron scattering. So this is a brief course summary. I cannot discuss everything lecture by lecture but very briefly. So I started with the definition of thermal neutrons because when I discuss neutron scattering for condensed matter, it is a thermal neutron which are useful and we I discussed with you that uh, the, in the reactor after moderation, after moderation we have a spectrum which is typically at the moderator temperature of around for Drupal let us say it is around 330 Kelvin, so approximately 50 degree centigrade uh, temperature of the moderator. Then you have a Maxwellian distribution of the energy of energy of neutrons and typically this has a peak around 30 milli electron volts and lower energy neutrons are known as cold neutrons typically below 5 milli electron volt and high energy neutrons are called uh, hot neutrons. So mostly we use for thermal neutron scattering neutrons from this range as well as from cold and hot uh, uh, regions but mostly in the thermal region. And this is a typical distribution that we discussed and I justified thermal neutrons because they have wavelength close to interatomic distance. They have energies typical with as we saw throughout our uh, discussion on inelastic, uh, atoms and molecules, uh, phonons, uh, diffusion and also vibrational spectrum. They are neutral so they can get deep in the sample. They have got very good contrast between isotopes and neighboring atoms unlike X-rays which depends on uh, X-rays depend on the uh, electron charge cloud and neighboring ne atoms their contrast is poor but here not only neighboring atoms but even between isotopes the contrast is good because the neutron nucleus interaction which is the strong in interaction in by nature when they have very good contrast between isotopes and notably between 1H1 and 1H2 hydrogen and deuterium so we can replace hydrogen with deuterium and vice versa depending on our requirement and we can generate very good contrast which is very important because when you replace hydrogen with deuterium the chemistry remains same more or less dynamics becomes slower but otherwise they are same and we can study selective parts of an object using neutron scattering they have a magnetic moment of minus 1.91 nuclear magneton and possibly they are the unique tool so far as magnetic structures are concerned microscopic magnetic structures are concerned and it's a non-destructive characterization so always it is welcome for any samples uh, I started with the Fermi golden rule and described how I can work out the cross sections using this expression here psi k and psi k prime are the incoming and the outgoing wave vectors I discussed in this course density of states as rho k and here I could use uh, the density of states multiplied by the transition probability from k to k prime and I mentioned to you that for diffraction experiments the magnitude of k and k prime remains same and we talk about structure in terms of elastic diffraction and I derived the angle dependent diffraction law that is g sigma by d omega number of neutrons per unit solid angle and then I found I showed you that there are two parts one which actually takes care of the interference from atoms at site RL and RL prime which gives us the structure and that is given by a prefactor which is a coherent scattering length and also we have got an incoherent scattering length which is V square average minus B average square and the total scattering cross section is an add of a coherent term and the incoherent term and 
Similarly, the total angle dependent scattering cross section has got a coherent term and an incoherent term. But in case of diffraction, the incoherent part is not interesting. It's basically a nuisance and it gives me background. Whereas this coherent part gives me the neutron diffraction pattern from which I try to solve for the structure. But uh, I showed you later that when you came to self correlation function, in that case, incoherent scattering plays an important role and we studied uh, incoherent quasi-elastic neutron scattering entirely for almost uh, always using hydrogenous material. So this was the take and I showed you how to calculate the coherent and incoherent scattering part for that you need to find out B average and B squared average. So B average comes from the fact that if I use up spin and down spin neutrons then I get two scattering length B plus and B minus uh, and that B plus and B minus the average is given because total spin of the neutron and the system is twice I plus one here I plus minus half plus one because I plus minus half is a spin of the system and neutron and this is either 2i or 2i plus 2. When it is plus it is 2i plus 2, when it is minus it is 2i is the total number of possible states with spin. Then, then weighing according to the number of quantum projections b average is nothing but i plus 1 upon twice plus i plus 1 b plus when it is plus and twice i upon twice i plus 1 plus twice i which is i upon twice i plus 1 when it is the neutron spin is opposite to the nuclear spin and b square average simply with the same weightage we find out the b plus square and b minus square and if there are several isotopes like uh, if I talk about hydrogen it has got a certain fraction of 1H1, 1H2, 1H3 and the relative concentrations if they are CK then I can use the same formula but now I have to do it for each and every uh, isotope and it becomes CK, IK plus 1 so one more suffix K comes and this CK is nothing but the concentration of the isotope so these are the CK uh, for them I have to written write down and then I can calculate B average and B square average and B square average minus B average square will give me the incoherent part and B average will give me the diffraction part. Uh, the st structure factor I mentioned for high neutrons and x-rays the only difference is here in the form factor. Neut x-rays have form factors which fall with Q and so at high angle you get low intensity for x-rays. In case of neutrons instead of form factor I have got a scattering length bj and this has, doesn't have any q dependence. So you can, you can say the form factor is constant with respect to q for neutrons. Uh, also I told you or that uh, structure first we can find out absolute periodic structure at 0 degree Kelvin. When we come to a finite temperature, there are, if these are the mean positions in a crystallographic lattice, then there are vibrations around the mean positions as we go to higher and higher temperature, higher and higher temperature, and that is taken care of by a factor known as d by Waller factor, where e square average is the average size or deviation of the atomic atom with respect to its mean position at a finite temperature. So this is due to thermal fluctuation. So this is due to dynamics and this is taken care of by a debye waller like factor in case of diffraction. And most importantly, what I mentioned was that we are 
seeking information in real space. G of R T is basically the correlation function in real space. But a Fourier transform over Q that means G R T D three R takes me to I Q T, which is an intermediate scattering law so function, and then one more integration, a Fourier transform over time takes me to S Q omega, which is the scattering law which we are measuring. Now it is desirable. That I do a double Fourier transform and get all my information on G of R T from my experiment, but usually that doesn't happen. So I have to start with a model. For example, for quasi-elastic neutron scattering, we started with a model which is e to the power minus r square upon 4 d t of a Fickian diffusion model, and then I Q T became e to the power minus d Q square t, and then S Q omega e p became a Lorentzian of d Q square Whole square plus omega square. So usually we have to figure out a model. When you do only structure work, then I can forget about omega. I am talking about S Q, and this comes from I Q, and they are same. If I don't bother about omega part of it, so. As I said, said just now, that S Q omega comes as a Fourier transform over I Q T, and I Q T can also come as a Fourier transform over S Q omega. And from these two expressions, you can see I Q zero is nothing but d omega S Q omega, and this is what we do normally. When we do our experiments, we have the incoming, let us say, in a reactor monochromatic beam, and we have either position sensitive detectors. Or end-on detectors looking at the looking at the sample. So we don't do energy analysis means we do an integration over energy, and what we get is I Q zero. So this gives an instantaneous picture. On the other hand, if we do an experiment where we ensure that the energy transfer is zero, then what I get is a time integration. Of the structure, but both of them they are identical because if I consider an experiment in which I find out I Q zero, but then I collect the data over a finite time which is much larger than the in the time scales in the system, and ultimately I get an averaging over time, frame by frame, and this is what we get inherently from an experiment at a Zero energy transfer. So these are the two ways we can do diffraction, and most importantly, we try to find out pair correlation functions through various experiments. This is the proper way, proper grammar of writing down the pair correlation function, because in quantum mechanics they don't. Uh, In, they don't commute with each other, so we have to keep them separately. And this is a definition and the grammar of writing down a pair correlation function. If R i is not equal to R j, then it is G distinct. That means correlation. That means a particle at origin at time zero, at origin zero. What is the probability of another particle at position R at time t? That gives me G of R t. Classically, I can write it as a single. Correlation function and it's a pair correlation function. If R zero is not equal to R j, and if R zero is not equal to, if I sum over all the positions, one a particle is certainly correlated with itself at zero time. So at zero time, the particle is only correlated with itself, which is a delta, and this is the time t equal to zero. That means this gives me if I have, let us say, I just. Take the example of a linear chain. So, this is the zeroth particle. It is connected with all the particles at zero Kelvin. I am saying. So, this gives you the pair correlation function. This is what you obtain in a diffraction experiment. And 
they are since s q omega and g of r t are fourier inverse of each other so we have to bring in uncertainty principle in our experiments and if i want certain delta r that is related to the delta q in my experiment and if i am targeting certain time scale or delta t in my system that is related to the energy transfer in my experiment so we need to choose the experiment depending on what you want to see so basically my choice of momentum transfer gives me my resolution in space in structure my resolution in delta t or resolution delta omega in energy transfer gives me the band of dynamics that i can see of various time scales delta t uh, this is just an example which i used that in a diffraction experiment the overall the delta r of my experiment is given by 2 pi by q max because that is the range of momentum transfer that i am having in my experiment and this whole data is giving me my structure in the system so delta r is dependent on 2 pi by q max and i have given an example for an wave vector transfer of 10 angstrom inverse with an incident neutron energy of 1.2 angstrom we need to go to almost 140 degree for a typical powder diffractometer and then quantum resolution comes out to be around 0.6 angstrom inverse typically in the range of interparticle distances similarly if i want to make the resolution poorer in real space that means here as an example is 30 angstrom then we can go to smaller q transfer as an example if you go to 0.2 angstrom inverse with a 4 angstrom neutron we do the experiment at an angle of 4 degrees only 140 degrees i said here 4 degrees and that this is a typical small angle neutron scattering angular range i discuss with you core configuration and how we have beam lines various beam lines in various places reaching the core then various core Play very various uh, additions to the core, like cold neutron source and hot neutron source, which will shift the spectrum towards the desirable energies. Experiments where we want to use long wavelength or slower neutrons, I need a cold neutron source. Or experiments where we need large energy transfer or smaller wave vector transfer, we need hot neutron source. I discuss the beam lines for neutron transportations, as well as neutron guides that carry neutrons by the principle of uh, total external reflection. Before we impinge the beam on a uh, uh, sample, we also tailor the uh, geometry of the beam using incoil filament collimators. we remove unwanted neutron energy using filters to give you compromise between size of the beam and the broadening of and the width of the beam rather what is the angular resolution we have what is known as solar collimators where a large beam is split by use of neutron absorbing materials like cadmium in case of reactors we use monochromatic neutron beams and we need monochromators monochromators are usually crystals that single crystals with some mosaic spray we use like uh, we have discussed copper 111 i think we use pyrolytic graphite 004 so these are the typical crystal crystallographic set of planes which is used depending on what lambda we need at what angle and it wo works on the principle of bragg reflection but you also have monochromators based on uh, based on uh, super mirrors where you literally reflect a neutron beam from a mirror 
optically. Uh, we also use mechanical assemblies like velocity selectors where we have cylindrical bodies with helical slots on them. They allow a neutron beam of certain wavelength with a broad wavelength distribution to go through. And last but not the least and very important, I discussed with you about neutron detectors because neutron detectors are very important with respect to neutron intensity measurement uh, in uh, reactors and also in spallation neutron sources. Next, I discussed with you that with after these uh, descriptions that uh, what can we see with neutrons. So there are two parts, one is structure part and one is dynamics part and uh, in the structure part we measure intensity versus angles, we don't do energy analysis and on the dynamics part we do energy as well as angle analysis. In the structure part we went from crystal structure all the way to small angle neutron scattering and reflectometry uh, in our uh, discussion. When we discussed uh, inelastic neutron scattering, we started with phonon dynamics and ultimately I discussed with you dynamics at uh, nanosecond length scale using Spinnico. And all these experiments are also having an additional advantage the neutrons having a magnetic moment of minus 1.91 nuclear magneton that all of these have an additional parameter which can be magnetic magnetic mesoscopic structure magnetic dynamics like uh, magnons or magnetic crystallographic structure and neutron is the most used tool for understanding magnetic structure and dynamics in condensed matter only which Q and which E range we need to use for a certain range of a certain range of structure length scales or certain range of dynamical time scales. That's what our choice has to be there. So in diffraction, I went from powder diffraction to single crystal, then local structure in liquid and amorphous systems, small angle neutron scattering to neutron reflectometry. And we discussed neutron detectors in one lecture where we I discussed with you various types of neutron detectors that I can use. Specifically, at the moment, uh, position sensitive detectors that we use in reactors and also uh, scintillation detectors that can be used at uh, spallation neutron sources. Mm. I discussed with you about neutron polarizers and spin flippers. <coughs> So I need to often polarize neutron beams and that can be done using Bragg scattering because in, there are some materials like Hoysler alloy where you can match the nuclear scattering length and the magnetic scattering length is of almost similar amplitude. So Fn plus Fm for one polarization is much larger than Fn minus Fm which is Fn minus Fn is almost equal to zero and we after Bragg reflection from such an alloy like Cu2 MnL I get a polarized neutron beam with one spin direction. It is also possible to have polarized neutron beam by use of super mirrors where we have critical angles much different for two spins and I have a can have a polarized beam by choosing an incident angle on the super mirror which is between these two values between these two values of critical angle this is the this is theta c for minus this is theta c for plus so i can use an ordinary monochromator first to get a monochromatic neutron beam and then i can reflect it from a super mirror to get a monochromatic polarized neutron beam uh, 
so we choose the direction by collimators, we choose the energy by monochromators, velocity selectors, filters. We also do polarization using drag diffraction, super mirror reflection. Of course, we can also do using helium-3 transmission, not available everywhere. In some of the sources, by transmission through a polarized helium gas, we can get a polarized beam of neutrons in transmission. This is a typical powder diffractometer which is used for magnetic neutron diffraction at Dhruva. This typical data which has been taken on this instrument and these are fits are by Rydfeld analysis of the data. This is a data from the <coughs> uh, HRPD, high resolution powder diffractometer at ICS. Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. Please note the way the peaks go here and here. Here because it is a despacing, so this is the low Q part here and this part is the high Q part in the low D spacing range because 2D sin theta equal to n lambda if you see as the D spacing becomes longer or the time of flight becomes longer, you go into the lower range of theta in the other diagram. Uh, Rydfeld refinement is a very commonly used tool and actually most popular tool possibly with X-rays and neutrons which is basically a chi-square minimization technique like all other techniques, the Y observed and Y calculated, we try to reduce the difference between them but it is refinement I told you earlier let me just remind you that you start with a structure known structure and refine it to get a good fit and that way we can get structure magnetic as well as physical structure of materials I just showed you one magnetic structure where you can see we can not only position the atoms by red well fitting but I can also give, give magnetic moment values at various sites for example, in this example, the iron, there are two irons having two different moments in this uh, ferry, ferry cyanide sample taken from this reference. Next, I discuss with you the local structures in liquid and amorphous systems. Just as an example, please see the difference here. This is what long range order crystallographic material, these are powder crystal, will look like in a diffraction experiment. You have sharp peaks all over Q. But when we talk about a liquid and amorphous system, you can see that S of Q, it gives first sharp diffraction peaks or second sharp diffraction peaks, but it goes to a flat line because in case of liquid and amorphous material, you have only local structure and we don't have a long range order and the consequence of that uh, in S of Q you get this kind of few peaks in low Q region and then going into flat background and from here we can find out the local structure in glassy materials here we have found out the structure you can see the fit using a reverse Monte Carlo technique uh, which actually minimizes the again the chi-square minimization process but the minimization is done through a Monte Carlo technique. We also discuss very briefly single crystal diffraction of material because it is difficult to get single crystals but if you have organic single crystals first the difference is that you have a large goniometer on the sample table because the single crystal needs to be oriented so that the reflection the Bragg reflection comes onto the horizontal plane in which the detector is moving. This is the detector arm here. You can see the detector in this photograph and you can find out the structures ab initio using single crystal diffraction. Followed by small angle neutron scattering. So in a small angle neutron scattering you can see the length scale drastically changes. In case of crystallographic material we talked about structures of one angstrom resolution. Now we are talking about sizes which are large 1 to 100 nanometers 1000 angstrom to close to 
crystallographic structure. This entire range uh, covers the range of what you call a small angle neutron scattering. In these cases, we don't look at the crystallographic structure of a medium, but rather inhomogeneities like this that you can see as shown here in the schematic uh, inhomogeneities and the size of these inhomogeneities in a medium which are often of lot of interest in industries for chemists for biologists and small angle neutron scattering is an important tool if you want to look at mesoscopic length structures mesoscopic length scales so then in the same mesoscopic length scale we can use neutron reflectometry for understanding structure and magnetism in thin films and we discussed uh, the techniques of uh, neutron reflectometry there are two kinds of reflectometry specular and off specular in case of specular reflectometry as you see here the results are shown you follow snell's law the incident and the outgoing angle are same incident angle is equal to reflection angle of reflection and here by solving the for the structure or you can extract data regarding thickness roughness magnetic moment density in thin films and uh, magnetic materials so this is a very important tool for understanding magnetism in thin films uh, uh, there is a technique called Parrot's formalism where using which we can actually fit a given structure to the experimental data and these fits are obtained actually from uh, PNR the polarized neutron reflectometry for a sample is shown here this is a nickel aluminium alloy and this is the X-ray reflectometry data the two techniques are very similar only fact is that in case of polarized neutron reflectometry we have an added advantage of finding out the magnetism at mesoscopic length scale in case of XLR we can find out the physical structure like density and thickness of thin films using X-ray reflectometry but advantage is also there that XLR is uh, a technique which has much higher intensity often compared to PNR so any thin film sample before we carry out any PNR or that on that it is desirable that we do an XRL measurement to find out the structure of the film and we also discussed off specular neutron scattering where the angle of incidence and an angle of reflection they are not same and when they are not same in that case when they are same let me just uh, remind you when these angles are same then my wave vector transfer is normal to the film surface but when they are not same when they are not same, when theta i and theta f are not same, then your wave vector transfer is at an angle to the normal to the film surface, and we have got a component which is along the film surface. We have a normal component and a component which is along the film surface, which can we call qx, and this study tells me height height correlation on a surface so here we did polarize I talked to you about off specular neutron reflectometry especially for magnetic interfaces and uh, I showed you how magnetic interface is smoother than a physical interface at this point I switched over to inelastic neutron scattering and I discussed with you how you can do inelastic neutron scattering. So here, similar in a reactor, you have a monochromatic neutron beam prepared by a monochromator. After that, there is a sample followed by an energy analyzer, which is important 
then inelastic neutron scattering because you need to know not only momentum transfer but also the energy transfer in the experiment and that energy transfer is measured using an analyzer crystal followed by a detector that this is known as a triple axis spectrometer very commonly used in almost all reactor sources for studying inelastic neutron scattering uh, by using inelastic neutron scattering we can find out dispersion relation or in crystals and also phonon density of states i discussed with you this is an example of uh, measurement of uh, dispersion relation in zircon so basically dispersion relation means we have omega versus wave vector inside a brillouin zone and we talk about uh, acoustic phonons as well as optic phonons and transverse and longitudinal phonons and this is all about the dynamics phonon dynamics in zircon this is important because this can we using i mean understanding the phonon dynamics you can understand many thermal and thermodynamic processes in the solid and this is an example of uh, uh, measurement of density of states you can see here we have found out e as a function of q and this is as i mentioned to you earlier while discussing it in details that we need to take care of the crystal symmetry and from the crystal symmetry and from group theoretical calculations we find out at which reciprocal lattice space i will do the measurement for which particular class of movements in a phonon dispersion relation and these are mentioned here that these are the various directions uh, at which these uh, not i mean various uh, class of uh, group uh, group theoretical class of motions that have been measured and this is a combination of data from various sources in case of uh, phonon density of states we, since we use a powder sample so the there is an averaging over q range and this is how the data looks like we followed it by quasi elastic neutron scattering which i discussed in last two lectures and this is for understanding diffusion in material and this uh, i discussed uh, with you with respect to various uh, organic materials in zeolite cages for when i chose the examples for dhruva and also i showed you how such slow dynamics can be measured using spin echo spectrometer in the beginning of the talk today so this is a quick summary of all the things that we did for neutron in neutron scattering during these lectures delivered by me thank you